you know, we've been working on building this people to people reparations. So for example, we have a national map where black and brown farmers, indigenous people put up their projects and folks who have inherited wealth and land who realize that this really isn't rightfully theirs, that it was stolen from a legacy of, of genocide, enslavement, you know, sharecropping and so forth, give it back. They just turn it right over. And um, that's been really powerful. You know, we also put together this land trust in the Northeast that's working on gathering up uh, return of land and, and giving right of first refusal to indigenous people um, and then redistributing what's left to black and brown farmers. So when you start talking about truth, I mean, I, I try to be in the business of telling the truth, but thinking about a process of truth together um, and these questions, you know, the first thing that really stuck out to me when I was reading a bit of the history of Juneteenth was that you know, there was a two year delay between the Emancipation Proclamation and the actual liberation, right? And in that two year period, the enslavers quite literally murdered one of the messengers who was coming to tell the truth that, you know, the war was over, slavery is over, to make sure that that word didn't get out. And then even with that, um, they kept trying to get one more harvest, you know, they're like just trying to delay the truth disseminating out so they can extract a bit more wealth off the backs of black people. And so I was thinking about the power of the word and the power of truth um, in that process of freedom. And really it was that moment when the truth finally hit that we were able to be free. Um, and thinking about in this moment when with the you know tragic recent lynchings of activists, uh, murders of activists, that what society is fearing in that um, is the word of truth. And perhaps we're in a moment of opening. The other thing it made me think about, which relates to your second question about like reparations being this midpoint between truth and reconciliation, comes out of a, a spiritual perspective. So I'm a farmer. I am also a member of clergy. I'm a queen mother in Vodun, and I'm an initiated devotee in the Yoruba religion. Uh, I worship Oya. And in my studies recently with my teacher, we were going over morning prayers. And so during morning prayers, there's a, you know, opportunity to give thanks, an opportunity to ask for forgiveness, to ask for the things we want, to chant some of our sacred literature. And something very interesting is when we ask for forgiveness in our morning prayers, and this is an indigenous religion of West Africa, the first thing we do is tell the truth. So we say, what is the thing we did that we feel bad about? But the second step is actually reparations. <laughs> you have to go and fix it. So if you took something, you got to give it back. If you hurt somebody, you got to go make it right. And then you can come back to the shrine, right? And your ancestors and the divinities um, then reconcile with you. But you actually don't skip over that part. You don't skip over the truth and you don't skip over the reparations. So I was thinking about this uh, indigenous way of understanding forgiveness as potentially being a model or you know, what we need to do as a nation when we think about uh, healing from generations of racial trauma, of white supremacy, of, of systemic injustice that's been just baked into every system from you know, farming to housing, to education, to policing, it's just baked in. And what does that look like to tell the truth, you know, to give it back and then, and then to reconcile? Because to be blunt, a lot of white folks wanna skip to the end and just figure out how to be nice to each other. Um, but being nice is actually not the solution to systemic injustice. And then, you know, I'm not so audacious as to imagine that I could outline a truth and reparations process having not been through one. Um, but I always think of, of these words, which many of you may have heard me share before, but um, one of my mentors and teachers, Ed Whitfield, who works, uh, a civil rights veteran, works on the co-op movement. You know, he says a great story about reparations. He says, you know, imagine your neighbor stole your cow broad daylight, everybody saw them do it. A couple weeks later, the neighbor comes over to your house feeling really bad about having taken the cow, like tears in his eyes, remorse in his heart, and says to you, look, I'm really, really, really sorry I took your cow. I know it was wrong, uh, but I'm going to make it up to you. Every week for the rest of the cow's life, I'm going to bring you half a pound of butter. Now, if you're anything like me, you would probably want the cow back and not uh, this pittance. And so I think the way that our nation up to this point has been trying to deal with racial injustice is, you know, we'll have a little scholarship program over here, a little um, tokenization and leadership in this institution over here, you know, maybe um, 
we'll put up a statue somewhere. This is the butter. Uh, but we really need to figure out that seven trillion plus dollar cow of unpaid wages, right? A whole continent worth of stolen land. This is not something that you can just pick around the edges to fix. We need to really tell it like it is, sit with the discomfort, sit with the pain, with the guilt, um, with the trauma of that together as a community, and then roll up our sleeves and make a plan to share it back. Because we can't go on. We can't go on with a 16 to one wealth gap where a white baby when they take their first breath in this country is 16 times wealthier than a black baby and not because they did calisthenics in the womb to earn it, right? It's because the ancestors of that black child had everything taken from them. Um, and we need to look at that. And I think that will be the first step um, towards creating this society of justice um, and healing that we desire. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Leah. Um, I deeply appreciate that. And um, um, I want to I want to now uh, go straight into uh, introducing Queen uh, Mother Mashariki, uh, and I'm going to say a little bit more about her. Um, and uh, so, Queen Mother Mashariki uh, is a lifelong resident of Indianapolis, uh, retired from Indianapolis Public School District, uh, continues to support public education. Married for 40 years, five adult children, um, and has been on the front lines. Um, one of the founders of uh, multiple organizations, including Red Beans and uh, Green Community Food Co-op, uh, the Indianapolis Kwanzaa Committee, um, Neighborhood Youth Committee, Youth Brigade, sorry, uh, Ujama Institute of Cultural Development and Rites of Passage over 30 years. Uh, part of uh, her local PTA, and is currently the national female co-chair of INCOBRA, which is the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And we met um, last summer in Ferguson um, for our uh, grassroots uh, reparations convening, and I was uh, duly uh, impressed and uh, I felt like I've been learning from Queen Mother Mashariki since that moment. And um, I'm so honored that uh, you uh, have given us your time to be here and speak with us today. Um, so the questions again um, uh, are in the chat and I can uh, say it. Um, what does June to Juneteenth say to us in this moment? How might you respond to the statement um, reparations uh, is a midpoint between truth and reconciliation. What might truth and rec reparations process look like in this moment? Greetings and thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be a part of this, this wonderful group. I also learn every time I'm, I'm in a chat or uh, if, I'm, if I'm on since this uh, this Zoom, I have not become an expert at it, but I'm always on it. And uh, uh, and thank you, uh, Sister Leah. I really appreciated your comments. Ed Whitfield is a good friend of mine, also, and uh, 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 some of his other stories. I, I think you're muted. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, and uh, as Brother Dave uh, shared with you, I am the female uh, national female co-chair of, of NCOBRA. Uh, NCOBRA's been around for well over 30 years. Uh, we have one goal, which is to obtain reparations for our people. And that's what, that's what we do. Uh, that's the work that we do. And currently, and uh, uh, Sister Leah, thank you so much for mentioning HR 40. Uh, you know, uh, John Conyers, before he died, uh, uh, with some help from NCOBRA uh, and NARC, uh, change HR 40 to be not a study bill, but a remedy bill. Uh, uh, because it's like, we, we've studied it. Uh, we know what's going on. And uh, so we appreciate him for that. But what I need each and every one of you to do, uh, you know, within the next few days or, or a few weeks is to uh, uh, either log on to NCOBRA's website, uh, which is uh, in Cobra uh, online.org 
and we have a, a interactive map where you can see the the uh, Congress people who have not signed on and uh, call them. And uh, you know, now is the time. I don't know what everybody's waiting on. So getting to the questions, what does uh, Juneteenth say to us in this particular moment? Uh, to me, what it says, and I appreciate the uh, celebration. We as, as a people, who, you know, we, we deserve that. But we're not free. Even though uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was passed, uh, and I think uh, if there's some of you are familiar uh, with uh, uh, Terry Collier, who uh, uh, did a song called uh, African Violet. And, you know, his whole thing was, hey, you know, say that we are free, but remove the means for us to be. Uh, so if we think about uh, what was going on during that time, and I understand Juneteenth uh, 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 with its inception was uh, very popular, and then it kind of waned out. Uh, and we can still celebrate that, but we have to understand what was going on with our people. Our people were let out into the universe with nothing. Uh, I always talk about Cali House. Cali House, can you, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, this is a book about Cali House. Her and Isaiah Dickerson uh, were in a contraband camp because that's where they put our people. They, they had nowhere to put us. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard about the punch bowl in Natchez, uh, 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 Mississippi. Don't ever eat no peaches from Natchez, Mississippi because thousands of our people went there, I mean, just trying to get away from the, the shackles that they were under, uh, and they kind of herded them like cattle, and where, where many of them died, thousands of them died, in fact. And then they created a peach orchard right there where our ancestors are. Cali House talks about the um, horrible conditions in those uh, uh, contraband camps. So yeah, we were celebrating freedom, but we, we still weren't free and, and we still not. Uh, we see what's going on with our children uh, and these police action shootings. Uh, Indianapolis has had one. Um, uh, Dre John uh, Reed, I'd like to lift his name up. Uh, and you know how modern technology is. This young man FaceTime his entire ordeal with the police. So people heard him fall. People heard the 12 or 14 shots in his back. And they heard one of the policemen say, oh, gonna have to have a closed casket, homie. Uh, and just think that his mother had to go and recognize that body. And in fact, he did have to have a closed casket because his face was all shot up. So uh, when we talk about freedom, you know, we, we, we have to understand uh, that uh, uh, as long as we have been here and, and regardless of how we live or, or the various places that we've been able to go uh, uh, and achieve, we still are not free. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, what's going on now will bring about some unity. And of course, we've got to put some direction to that uh, uh, so that we can move from this point forward. So in response to reparations is midpoint, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Because number one, uh, these folks that we have been living with and living under don't know the truth if they saw it and, 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 and wouldn't tell it. Uh, but reparations, I believe, should, should come first. Uh, and if you indulge me just a second, I would like to, and I've read this before, some of you may have heard it. It's one of my, my favorite writings of Dr. Yolanda Pierce, uh, if some of you know her. Let's not rush to the language of healing before understanding the fullness of the injury and the depth of the wound. Let us not rush to offer a Band-Aid when the gaping wound requires surgery and complete reconstruction. Let us not offer false equivalencies, thereby diminishing the particular pain being felt at a particular circumstance in a particular historical moment. Let us not speak of reconciliation without speaking of reparations and restoration, or how we can repair the breach and how we can restore the loss. Let us not rush past the loss of this mother's child, this father's child, someone's beloved son. So that's kind of my response uh, uh, to that. 
uh, uh, and I think we all are seeking of the truth. Uh, but again, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because for this country to own up and to tell the truth uh, about what it has done to us, uh, I'm sure it's very difficult because they've, 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 they've suppressed it so much. Uh, uh, but the, sorry. sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so anyway, that, that's my response to that. Uh, uh, what might truth and re uh, reparations process at this moment look like? Uh, it's it's going to take a lot of struggle, uh, brothers and sisters. It's going to take a lot of time, and it's going to take a lot of us coming together, which is something that uh, we have not done a lot. Uh, you know, we have so many naysayers, we have so many, you know, peoples whose minds have been uh, totally, totally controlled uh, uh, by, by other people. They can't hardly think for themselves. So we have a lot of work to do. I'd like to depend on the young people. I'd, I'd like to give them what they need because they have the energy. And that's what Encobra's trying to do. Our... Um, convention is coming up the end of July and our focus is on uh, uh, the, the young generation and how we can come together uh, because many of us are of the age that uh, uh, we, we need to be uh, able to sit down. Uh, I'm not sure that I'll ever do that, uh, but we do need to bring young people in. Uh, so that's why we're pushing reparations. That's why we're, we're trying to get uh, uh, young people to understand. Why do we need reparations? We need it for all the uh, things that have been done to us as, as a people and continue to be done. Uh, but who'd have thought we'd be right here today? And, 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 and the police, now I want to say something about that. Our relationship with the police department, because sometimes people say, well, there was a black man, there was a black policeman. It doesn't matter. It's the institution. And we have had the same relationship with them ever since the Fugitive Slave Act. That, that was their role uh, in our community. <clears throat> and that continues. And so we, we need to understand our history and know that and uh, put in place in our community ways that we can listen to young people and, and try to give them uh, the direction that, that they need so that uh, hopefully one day we will be free. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mother Mashariki. And I just, I just want to um, let you know, like we're having some technical problems, just with um, there are people trying to get on the Zoom call, and uh, the account is supposed to be able to handle that. Um, so um, more people are trying to join, but I, I wanted to just kind of uh, pause here for a minute. Um, and ask everybody to just take a breath. And also, I want to point out um, the UN has described reparations in five areas of um, compensation, restitution, um, healing, spiritual, mental, physical, satisfaction, which is a building of a uh, cultural institution. Um, um, the uh, putting up of memorials, education, uh, and also guarantees of non-repeat. How do we create a system that does not um, reinforce or do the same thing that the system prior to reparations did? So how do we change it? Um, and thank you, Queen Mother. Um, really appreciate that. And I wanted to uh, now move to uh, Professor uh, Margaret uh, uh, Burnham, who's a professor at Northeastern University School of Law, founder of the Civil Rights uh, and Restorative Justice Project. And um, Professor Burnham has worked at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund um, and also um, 
uh, worked with um, uh, the Communist Party USA as a lawyer and is well known for defending Angela Davis. Um, and um, Professor Burnham was the first African American woman uh, uh, judge in the state of Massachusetts and um, serving as Associate Justice of the uh, Boston Municipal Courts until 1982. And she was uh, one of the lawyers in the landmark uh, federal lawsuit uh, case against um, Franklin County, Mississippi for the law enforcement agents uh, involving the Ku Klux Klan kidnapping in 1964, uh, where uh, two 19-year-olds were tortured and killed. Henry D. and Charles Eddie Moore. Um, it's such a pleasure uh, to uh, be in this conversation with these distinguished panelists and um, Professor um, Burnham, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much for that warm um, introduction. Yeah, and uh, I, I regret that I didn't send in a little bio as you requested. Uh, all of those lawyers who courageously represented the Communist Party USA would probably take offense if they knew that you assigned that to me. Um, they did uh, yeoman's work over the course of their long lives, uh, but that wasn't part of my representation. Um, I have had uh, the privilege of uh, representing uh, folks all across this country who have struggled for uh, for justice, um, but uh, including, uh, as you mentioned, Angela and many, many others. Um, so I, I thank you and uh, I am really grateful for the opportunity to um, join Queen Mother Mashariki um, and Leah Peniman, and I thank uh, all of you uh, for your work, especially I thank Encobra uh, for having uh, worked so long in the vineyards on this question of reparations with uh, very, very little public attention being given to it. Uh, and uh, the uh, Encobra has kept on this and, uh, and deserves to uh, uh, and will uh, provide a leadership uh, role as we move into this next iteration of the struggle for reparations which is a 150-year-old, 200-year-old struggle in our country, in the United States. Um, so uh, we're talking today about the relationship between uh, reparations um, and restorative justice. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're talking about these uh, concepts and movements uh, at a point in time when our entire country is uh, on the alert and in movement um, as a um, senior, of course, uh, someone who's been committed to uh, progressive, uh, the progressive movement my entire life. I uh, really didn't, didn't know whether, when folks would get back into the streets again. Um, so although obviously the cause is one um, that gives us, um, make, um, uh, gives us great pause and, uh, and, uh, and is, is both uh, is, 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 is sad and enraging at the same time, uh, we are also thankful uh, that our young people have taken to the streets and uh, we know that it is our uh, responsibility, all of our responsibility to maximize the potential of this moment uh, because it too uh, will pass. And certainly uh, it's in that context that the work that Encobra has done for so many years to put reparations on the table, uh, queuing it up uh, with uh, John Conyers and now with Barbara Lee taking uh, taking uh, the word to Washington, um, and also uh, invigorating the ground roots, and, uh, the grassroots, and taking this question uh, to the UN. Uh, without uh, all of that work, we wouldn't be in a position where reparations would clearly uh, be so prominently on our agenda today. So I, I, I'd like to say just a couple of things. First of all, I think we need to, uh, as we as we begin to um, think more deeply about what rep what a reparations process what project would look like in our country. Uh, I, I wanna say a couple of things. First of all, I wanna say um, that reparations has to be conceived um, in the context of a uh, struggle against um, capitalism. It has to be situated in the struggle um, against racial capitalism. 
Uh, and so, you know, and, and, and that, uh, that provides not just a context for us to think about reparations in the United States, but it also positions our reparations movement within a global uh, structure and struggle around capitalism and uh, colonialism. Um, because we know, as we know, capitalism really never pays its debts. And that's true not just only in our own country. It's, not tr it's true not just with slavery, but it's true in the aftermath of slavery. Uh, and the reparations, our reparations movement, our struggle around reparations has to be, con uh, has to be situated uh, within this demand um, that capitalism uh, become, uh, that we begin to reckon uh, with the damage and destruction um, and losses that it has caused among uh, folk all across our country. Um, it has to be placed in the context, uh, also our reparations movement has to be placed in the context of the broader uh, Black um, Holocaust in this country. Uh, it has to be seen uh, in the context of the Black Holocaust as an ongoing phenomenon. Um, uh, a, a, not a single um, historical event, but uh, an event uh, that has been, you know, started, it, that is ongoing, that continues, um, and that for, and for which we don't see really any foreseeable um, exit, although our folk, as I've said, are in the streets. Um, so, um, you know, we have to sort of understand that, yes, we've had these, these um, interruptions of the Black Holocaust. We had the end of slavery, which we celebrate uh, on, Ju with, uh, on our Juneteenth celebrations. Um, in 1865, we had uh, Reconstruction, we had the Civil Rights Movement, then we had the Obama presidency. Uh, but these are merely interregnums on a long, long trail of, um, of uh, black, uh, uh, black domination. Um, so the reparations movement has to be seen um, as one that lifts up um, the, uh, the, the dynamics of um, of of, of, Afri of uh, African American um, oppression in this country and the oppression of uh, people of color, of poor people in this color, that lifts up these five elements of that oppression, which include uh, exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural domination, and violence. Uh, and so, you know, we've worked on all of these fronts. Um, and all of them are, uh, we engage uh, when we talk uh, about, uh, when we discuss um, and put forth a demand uh, for reparations. Uh, I wanna say further that reparations is not a standalone um, remedy. Um, it's not a substitute uh, for um, other requirements of justice like equal access um, to opportunities across our country. It's not about affirmative action. Uh, reparations is uh, a structural uh, dynamic, a structural demand um, that has to be put on the table uh, with all of, as a transformative demand that has to be put uh, on the table uh, with uh, the other requirements of what it takes uh, to, um, to make justice uh, in our country um, today. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, let me just um, say as well uh, that uh, reparations has to be seen uh, in the context of the cu current struggles around abolition. Um, and so when we, you know, obviously the, the, what today the demand is uh, to abolish policing as we know it. Um, and we've also, we also have, we have also seen uh, the demand to abolish prisons. Uh, and so, you know, as we come out of our June um, 10th uh, uh, commemorations, uh, we have to think about our work, including the demand for reparations in the context of these, this larger and ongoing uh, abolition movement, um, movement towards liberation and abolition, Abol abolishing uh, all of the structures the infrastructures, the superstructures, um, and the systems um, that have perpetuated Black oppression uh, over, these, uh, over these long years. Um, and, and obviously, that comes from the abolition movement that ultimately results in the victory, uh, which we commemorate with June, uh, Juneteenth. Uh, but we have to see also, when we talk about um, abolishing 
uh, prisons. We're also talking about uh, looking very closely at the structures um, that keep us, uh, keep us uh, subordinated uh, and marginalized and subjected to violence uh, and uh, that, that strip us from our, our, our cultural roots. Uh, we have to see that also in the context um, you know, uh, when we talk about abolishing police, uh, we have to say we have to say to our folk: uh, Do are we are we leaving our folk without security and without safety when we need it? No, uh, we're not saying we're not proposing that at all. Uh, we are proposing uh, that we need to take uh, control uh, of our own safety. We need to create. Uh, our own safety and security. We need to create and support and have the wherewithal um, to support our own uh, communities. And we need to have a different relationship with a state uh, which is not delivering uh, what it promises and what it should, what, what delivering what it is responsible for, i.e. safety so we can walk down the street, healthcare, so that we are not uh, disproportionately subjected to uh, pandemics like uh, like COVID. Uh, pandemics are always going to expose us um, to expose the the fault lines the, uh, in 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 our system. Um, and, but you know, but but this is a state that has failed us. Um, and therefore, uh, when we ask for abolition, what we're putting forth um, is. Uh, the, the view um, that something new has got to come out of this moment. Something new has got to come out of this time. Uh, and let me just say, finally, the relationship between uh, re uh, restorative justice and reparations. Uh, I could say more about what I think the theoretical and doctrinal and practical uh, relationships between um, all of those are, but let me just say that these are these are theories of repair. Um, this is about what it takes um, to, um, to, to uh, repair relationships, um, to, to live in a, a, in, a, in a state of constant repair. And the business of repair is all around us. Repair is the process of becoming something else. Um, that's how we deal with trauma, by becoming somebody else, by getting over our trauma and moving into another place. To repair is to really to be alive, um, to be engaged, to be in community, um, to be in solidarity. That's what repair is all about. Um, and so uh, repair is a piece, a, a, an essential piece uh, of reparation uh, but it's also uh, an essential piece and part of what we need when we talk about restoring justice to uh, restoring justice. How are we going to be in relation uh, with one another? Um, how are we going to take care and repair that which is broken? Um, so that's how, that's the one way in which I see our movement to engage in restorative justice, to own our justice system, to take control of our justice system as being aligned and in partnership with our movement uh, to uh, make a reparation. So I think, uh, uh, thank you so much also, uh, Leah, for the wonderful metaphor of the cow and the butter. And I wanna close by saying, uh, two things. Number one, we need the cow back and we need the butter. We need both. Both have to happen. And that, I want to say one final thing in respect to Barbara Lee's um, bill. Um, it's, a, it's a call, it's a beginning, but the work of repair, the work of reparation, the insistence that our work towards reparation include restorative approaches historical, deep-seated uh, learning about restorative practice. Uh, all of that is up to us. That's not up to the politicians. The politicians can't do it. That's up to us. That has to be a grassroots, grassroots informed, community informed process that we have to own. Does the state have to be involved? Absolutely. 
Absolutely, the state has to be involved. And let me just say finally on the question of reparation, the reason why you need state uh, participation um, is because, you know, it's the state that has uh, supported the subordination. All of that comes from the state. So the state at some point has to pay its dues, but the state can't control that process. We have to control that process, that long uh, road, walking that long road toward, which has now been made shorter, in part thanks, um, as I said, to the work of all of you who have joined this conversation. Brother David, thank you so much for giving me a few minutes to speak. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. And I, you know, I just, I, I want to affirm all that was said and um, just kind of work my way backwards. Um, and, um, you know, I think about like the no the notion that the process has to be grassroots. And I think back to when Mike Brown Jr. was killed in Ferguson and we started the Truth Telling Project for the uh, express purpose that people were calling for a national truth and reconciliation process. And we insisted on a local truth telling process uh, where even though people from all over the country came, people could tell their truth. And it was about us healing and us dealing and us affirming each other um, and also providing a platform to so people can learn um, about uh, not just police killing people, but the structural violence that that's rooted in. And I really appreciate you talking about um, uh, repair as a process of becoming. Um, and also I appreciate uh, Queen uh, Mother Mashariki uh, talking about like the, the insistence on a reparations process, right? That, that has uh, continued um, since we've been here on these shores um, and given the ongoing uh, violence that black folks are experiencing, like what our, what, what our, our future descendants and, and we as ancestors demand. Um, and I appreciate uh, Sister uh, Leah Penniman uh, for speaking to the spirituality embedded um, in um, like, the notion of reparations and this idea that uh, when we're uh, looking for forgiveness, we tell our truth, right? And, the, and before we move on to anything else, there has to be uh, repair. Um, and so we're gonna take um, about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, uh, Amy is gonna uh, divide us into groups um, and I would like for you all to um, spend a few minutes. Um, you can either respond to the questions um, that are in the chat feature and I can just re uh, them there. And um, it's gonna be uh, about five to six people per group. Uh, but, but um, oops, sorry. Um, but you can also um, respond, I, I cut and paste the wrong thing in there, uh, but you can essentially respond uh, to what was said um, and uh, what was said, um, what stood out for you and what questions you have. Um, so Amy, uh, go ahead and let's uh, put people in, in those groups. Okay, I think everybody will um, see a dialogue box um, that you'll have to click to join your group, just FYI. Here we go. And I'm gonna still put those questions in there. Give me a second. Some green and um Um, hi, Leah, who just joined. We're um, just assigning Mommy. to breakout groups, so I will assign you to one. Mommy. Oh, well, I missed the beginning. So. It's Leela, I think. Sorry.
So folks who are still in the main room, um, um, let me know if I can help you figure out how to join your breakout room. You should see um, the opportunity to join near the bottom of your screen. Um, if you can't see it, you can try clicking on more um, along the bottom of your screen um, and you should be able to see um, breakout room as an option. Together, green and brown. Okay, baby, just green okay. and brown. Maybe we can pause the uh, recording for a minute. Yeah, sorry. No, no, no problem. Evidence of that is in the current uh, crisis in South Africa, uh, where in the majority African community. Um, is still suffering deep uh, marginalization and economic deprivation um, and discrimination. Um, and so um, the TRC uh, on that score, in, in as much as it did not really um, exemplify or uh, enact uh, fundamental change, a fundamental economic change, um, and, uh, and, and, and that may be asking too much of a TRC, um, and, but also uh, the TRC made a decision um, that it was not going to, it was going to uh, require uh, the, um, uh, uh, those who participated uh, in the TRC to drop any claims um, that they might have um, against those who had, uh, had wronged them. Uh, and uh, that's a question um, that, would be, that is available for every TRC. There are many who think that the TRC made the wrong call there. There's much to learn uh, from that um, experience. Um, and uh, and, 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 and we, we are all the richer for it, uh, but there are also lessons uh, of warning um, to be learned from, um, the, from the TRC. Thank you. Queen Mother Mashariki. Of course, I, I did not. Am I muted? Can no. you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Sister Margaret, I really uh, uh, appreciate uh, your comments. Uh, when I was uh, in um, uh, Durban, South Africa, as well as, well as uh, uh, we also was in uh, Soweto, and talking to the people on the ground, uh, uh, they, they really did not... Uh, uh, feel like they were affected much from the Truth and Reconciliation uh, uh, Commission uh, uh, there in South Africa. And so, uh, as Sister Margaret said, there's lessons to be learned. So we need to look at that history and make sure we don't make the same mistakes, number one. Uh, and of course, it's, it's, it's a different animal, uh, very similar, but, but very different. Uh, so we have to look at that. Um, now, I did not quite get the question on Tulsa. What was that? Uh, it, it, wasn't, it was, it was maybe, it was uh, actually, it was, it was private. All right. So oh, someone was private. mentioning the $6, six million fund um, that the Cerro Foundation created to honor the victims of the 1921 Tulsa uh, massacre. And it, it may be Tulsa is coming up. Uh, the, the, the president at one point was saying that he was going to go speak in Tulsa hmm. on June 19th. Um, a good friend of mine, Rico Wright, just announced that he was running for mayor of Tulsa. Uh, check him out, he's amazing. But um, maybe if you wanna speak to this, this piece, because we often think that reparations is just for uh, slavery. Um, but um, it's- Well, it's, uh, we, yeah. we, we all know it, it goes beyond that. Uh, because, uh, you know, after the enslavement period, you know, we, we had to deal with uh, Jim Crow, and then uh, uh, imagine uh, how our young people would feel uh, if a, a place like Tulsa had been able to flourish, flourish. Uh, uh, Rosewood, 
Uh, and so every time, even, even right after the enslavement period, our people worked hard and they built a whole community with banks and, and everything. And just with somebody putting forth something that wasn't true, uh, uh, it was destroyed. Uh, and so we see whenever uh, Black progress, you know, is on the rise, uh, somebody's trying to figure out how to dismantle it and how to destroy it. Uh, so we've got to learn those those lessons uh, as, as we're moving forward and building uh, uh, these new communities that we talk about. Uh, uh, and I think uh, Tulsa probably, if they looked at it in retrospect, part of their issue was, I don't think they had a security force. And so uh, I don't know if you all recall when 40 Acres and a Mew came about and the ministers that uh, uh, talked about that and, 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 and wanted that said, we've got to have someone to protect us because they already knew what was coming after them. Uh, of course, you know, we see what they did with that. We still have people in the South who are in Cobra members that keep talking about the 40 acres and a mew. They're serious about it. Uh, uh, so we've got to, uh, what I just I call my say, 40 acres too. How about that? <laughs> mm. uh, no, no, that's okay. You know, but uh, we have to learn the lessons from the past so that we don't repeat those. Uh, uh, because they, they keep doing uh, uh, the same thing, regardless of what you may thought or think of the move community in Philadelphia, they bomb those people in, 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 in modern times. And so we know what they're capable of. And so as we are, we're building our new communities and you know, uh, um, uh, getting our young people on board, uh, we have to uh, uh, teach them that history and we have to plan strategies on how not to repeat it. So you all, we are at our time and I just wanna like thank our guests uh, for being a part of this. I wanna thank everyone for taking time out of your day to learn and honor the legacy uh, of uh, the freedom of black folks who were uh, held in bondage in this country um, and all over the world. Um, uh, and um, I want to stop and give Amy, um, who is part of the Community of Living Traditions at the Stony Point Center, a chance to make a, a few quick announcements. We have some upcoming stuff real quick. Hey, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this has been really amazing. and. Um, uh, as Shirley said at the beginning, this um, session is part of a series that we're doing as a community to try to basically use this challenging time to um, live into a new normal and be part of living into a new normal that's more just for, for everyone um, rather than going back to the old normal. So I'm going to just paste in um, a URL here that um, like basically describes the series and it contains um, some of the information on the upcoming um, events that we're having. It every when, it's every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And next week we'll be focused on a commemoration and discussion of the Stonewall Uprising. And the week after that, we will be doing a book discussion on Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. So, and you can check that page also for updates. Um, on future sessions. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you all. Um, and we will, for folks who ask questions that we didn't get to, I'll send them to our speakers and see if they can uh, respond. Um, David, I just want to say thank you, too. And uh, I've been reading the, the questions in the chat. And um, thank you so much for the questions. They're, they're really very thoughtful and provocative and it sounds like a lot of people have a lot of knowledge to share um, on these subjects. So I, I hope uh, we'll get to uh, talk as a community again. Where, and I also encourage folks to take part in the Movement for Black Lives, um, actions in defense of Black Lives. Um, we are in trying times and um, part of making repair, part of is showing up. And so show up in whatever way you can and also reach out to your congressperson uh, and encourage them to um, sign um, 
uh, and push for HR 40, which is the reparations bill that, um, that was put forward. Um, uh, I think that's it. There's one thing that popped in my head, y'all, I'll be forgetting stuff, but um, such a pleasure to see so many friends and I'm just gonna blow kisses at all of my friends. All right, thank you all. <laughs>